please welcome Jamel McGee and Andrew Collins. Hey, hey let's go. Those lights. Jamel, I mean, we, you're from Benton Harbor, which is a pretty tough place. Yes. I'm from uh, Alabama, which um, can be its own kind of tough place. And I, I, I have this sort of, um, I'm, I'm a pacifist because I'm a Christian, but I also have this kind of violent Alabama streak in me <laughs> in which I don't like people to mess with me and I don't like people to mess with people I love. And um, I, I kind of have this sense that um, if I were in your shoes, there would be still days I think I might wake up and want to kill Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's it like for you now, years into this process of having to deal with losing four years of your life to prison and being wrongfully charged and losing your voice? Um, what it's like now, it's, huh, it's a lot better now. I, um, at that time, um, it was rough for me. Um, I was dealing with a lot. Um, mentally because of this um, situation. And what, got, what gets me through is um, the help of God first and foremost and also uh, wanting something different for my son. Mm -hmm. You tell in your, in, your, in your congratulations on a new book just out that I'm sure many of you will uh, be very interested in reading called Convicted, um, that in your Early on in prison, you, uh, you feel all this rage coming out at you for wrongful imprisonment, mm -hmm. and you get in these horrific fights, yes. which you always win, and, um, yeah. but you realize that it's that rage and that um, you're, you're kind of fantasizing about uh, yes. <laughs> punishing. And, and in the midst of the rage in those fights, um, I didn't see those people for who they were. I saw Andrew um, because I, that's all I thought about was seeking him out and hurting him yeah. um, because of what had happened and what he did. So Andrew, um, what was um, the process like for you when you, you, I'll come back to this storytelling in a moment, but you get out of prison yourself and then you two meet. What's that early experience like for you and beginning <laughs> to deal with um, what you've done? Yeah, so uh, once I got caught, I uh, started very quickly getting myself back. Like, I didn't wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm going to be a corrupt police officer. It was kind of this, this slow fade of giving away my integrity. Uh, so, so it was almost immediate after I got caught that I started uh, kind of getting the old me back, getting really who I was back. And uh, so I had this radical encounter with Jesus throughout this entire, uh, uh, these the circumstances. And while I was in prison, I really felt like God was calling me back to Benton Harbor to be reconciled with people. My wife thought I was crazy. My pastor thought I was crazy. Everybody said, you just need to flee. You need to stay away from there. But I really felt like God was calling me back there. So in 2011, after I'd been out for about a year, uh, I was in Broadway Park, which is the south side of Benton Harbor, and uh, there was an a, a outreach event going on there, and uh, my church was hosting it, and I was there, and I was willing to have conversations with people, and, and one of those people ends up being Jamel, and he came at me through the crowd. Uh, I tell people he wasn't walking towards me, he was walking at me. <laughs> and, uh, and he reached out his hand to shake my hand, and I thought, okay, this is that reconciliation I'm looking for. But when I gripped his hand and I said, Jamel, right? He, uh, he squeezed down to the point where I thought he was going to break my hand. And, uh, and I thought that was going to be the day of reconciliation. And, and that's just not what happened. So, you, um, you, you all tell a story in your book about how this is, this is obviously deeply personal. But it's also a story that's deeply social. Um, and you talk a lot about the ways in which your personal experiences are a consequence of social dynamics and powers yeah. that are greater than you. And there's lots we could point to, but I mean, one that especially comes to mind is that, Jamel, you were, you were charged with um, possession, one ounce of crack cocaine, and in the, uh, wrongfully charged, but convicted nonetheless, and sentenced to 10 years in federal prison, correct? Yeah, correct. And, and Andrew, you were charged with a variety of charges, uh, which you admitted to doing, including possession, including stealing, um, including uh, corruption, falsifying reports. And you were sentenced to, what, three years in federal prison? Three years, yeah. yeah. So what, what do you make of um, these discrepancies just in, yeah. in sentencing, for example? 
Yeah, so I mean, you look at the case, and, and Jamel and I had the same exact judge. Uh, I lied in front of that judge in Jamel's case, and then I had to answer to that judge once my case came up two years later. Uh, so same judge, same courtroom, same exact crime. We were, we were uh, sentenced on the same crime. Possession of crack with intent to deliver over five grams, under 50, first offense. Jamel had never been in trouble with a drug crime before, neither had I. I admitted guilt, he fought it all the way to trial, and at one point the judge told him, you have wasted this court's time, it is obvious you are guilty, and I am going to sentence you to the maximum of my ability. So he was sentenced more harshly because he chose to use his right to take it to trial, because he knew he was innocent. So I just, I look at that now, and, and, and you know, back in 2005, 2006, when this is all happening, you know, uh, social justice, uh, unfair sentencing guidelines, we weren't talking about that stuff, right? We were living it. And uh, now you look back on it and you say, how in the world could that even pass? So, so if me as a, a white man can, can see that happen and say, you know what, it's just a coincidence that that all happened. If, if we continue to stay ignorant to the problems that are in front of us, uh, if we continue to walk away from these conversations because it's convenient for us as white people too, then we never step into a place where we get to help our black and brown brothers out and sisters too. Uh, and these same systemic issues continue, so. And Jamel, this was not your first instance of having to deal with a sort of unjust treatment at the hand of the system, is that right? No, <laughs> this is definitely, you know, it wasn't the first. Um, and it definitely wasn't the last either. Yeah. And you, you say in your book that your sense in that experience was that um, you were not innocent until proven guilty, but guilty until to you could prove, prove your innocence. innocence. Yeah. What, what was that? How, how did that shake out? <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, it was hard. And I still couldn't, no matter what I tried to prove, to prove my innocence, um, it was just unheard of. Nobody wanted mm -hmm. to hear that. Um, it was rough for me um, to know that, like, everybody just thought I was guilty right off the bat without even a question, not even talking to me. I was just guilty. Um, even my family mm -hmm. thought I was guilty. And that was just, you know, it was wrong. And it was because of... Um, they believe the officer, you know, just like the judges and the prosecutors and everybody else. They believe that what he said. And just because he said he saw me with the drugs and putting him in the, um, the center council, um, everybody took that and just ran with it. It was like, okay, yeah, he's a drug dealer. So those times for me was just, man, it was just rough. and. I just felt backed into a corner, and um, I just had to ultimately just deal with it. So what makes it possible for the extension of the kind of forgiveness you've extended? And Andrew, on your side, what makes it possible to receive that kind of forgiveness that you've needed to receive? Jamel? Well, what made it possible for me because first, this situation was hurting me farther um, because I, I was hurting people in prison because I was hurt. Um, and that was the only way I could deal with it. And in the midst of that, um, I wanted to do something different first for my son. I wanted to give him something positive to look up to and, um, with Andrew, with, with him, it was just like, God, God forgave us before, and before me, me even before I was born. Uh, who am I to hold this thing against him? I didn't have no control over the situation at all. So that right there alone, was enough for me to just walk away from the situation and just leave it alone. But to actually just really, really feel to let this thing go was, I had let it go already, you know what I'm saying? Because it was eating me up inside. I've had thoughts of hurting myself because of this thing. 
And, but the most thing that was intriguing that Andrew came forth and admitted his wrongs. And not only did he do that, when I did see him, he was straight apologizing. So that apology and his willingness to stand up and step forward and say, hey, I wronged this person. And it didn't matter at that point who I was or what color I was. He was being a man and saying, I wronged this person. And that ultimately helped and, and is helping in the process of forgiving. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd say for me, like receiving the forgiveness is there's been several times almost like layered apologies for me and Jamel. The, the original time was just like this blanket apology. Like I was, I was an awful human being. I did really bad things and I know I did and I'm so sorry that I did those things to you. No justification, no minimization. There's no reason that I can give you as a reason why I did what I did. All I can say is I'm sorry. Uh, and then as we got to know each other more, I started to see how my actions had affected him. You know, when we came back together, when God brought us back together through that nonprofit, Jamel was homeless at the time. And, and there was this place where I came, in, came into this realization that had he not had to walk through what I did to him, uh, he may not be in that place of homelessness at that point in his life because he didn't have that long break that he had to rebuild from. Uh, so that was another conversation we had to have where I had to say to him, man, I'm, I'm so sorry. And he's just, he's, he's so grace uh, grace filled towards me. He's, he's a reminder of Jesus in the flesh for me. And then there was a time we were working on the book and, and, and uh, he was talking about how his family didn't believe him. And it wasn't until I came out after we came back together and, and our local paper did a story where I admitted everything I had done that his mom came back to him and said, you know what, I'm sorry I've treated you like this for all these years. I really thought you were a drug dealer, but now that he said that he lied, I, I believe you now. And it's like, Man, not only did I take your freedom away from you, but I took your voice away from you. Like, that's, that, that hurt. So I said to him, you know, like, I need to apologize to you again. And, and I think he's getting sick of me apologizing to him. But it's like these, <laughs> these layers of realization of, of how much I hurt him in that action. Yeah. Uh, let me, let's take the few minutes we have left for two questions. Um, so the first question is going to be social, and the second question will be personal. Uh, social, person, social dimension and personal dimension. So with regard to the social, what would you say to those who say, all of this social justice stuff, blah, it's all about personal responsibility and if everybody will do what they're supposed to be, everything will be fine. Um, and I'm sick of hearing about the social dynamics of injustice. What would you, what's, your, what's your kind of quick one to three sentence response to that? They're sick. <laughs> or something's wrong. They got a cold, a flu, or something. Because <laughs> if if you're blind to the injustice, um, then you you just don't want to see it. You just you're content where we are. Um, yeah. That's you're just content with what, where we are. Yeah. And I would add to that that uh, you know as as a, a white human being. Uh, to my brothers and sisters from Caucasia, uh, that we, we have the privilege, this is not a real place, don't Google it, uh, we have the privilege to walk away from these conversations because we get uncomfortable. I've told Jamel, uh, now that we hang together and we travel together, I used to think black people were paranoid until I started hanging out with him. And, and I've seen the way that he's treated differently than I am, so it's, it's given me a racial awakening. Uh, and, and, but in my awkwardness, in my whiteness, I can choose to walk away because it's, it's tense and I don't really know what to do with it. And if I don't have answers, I don't want to deal with it. I have the privilege to walk away, but I leave my brother still in that place where he has to deal with it. So, so to my white brothers and sisters, educate yourself, learn about the terminology you're hearing. Don't just glaze over and say, eh, I just, I don't know enough about it. I don't want to deal with it. Racism is over. Slavery is over. That's, that's so easy to say, but the systemic leftovers that are still there, we have to deal with, and it has to be in this generation. That was about eight sentences. I'm sorry. Well, yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll let you slide with those because they were so good. A lot good. of run-ons too. Yeah. Uh, so the personal dimension. 
Uh, what, do you, what do you say, what kind of counsel do you give to those who are struggling with their own bitterness and their own hurts uh, of what others have done to them, who can't find a way to let go, or who have the heavy weight of things they know they have done to others mm. and they don't know how to deal with that? Okay. I would say for the, the ones that's finding it hard to forgive, man, just understand there was our Father that's in heaven forgave us, um, and he's continuing to forgive us for every little thing that we do, as long as we repent it. And just, just think, for everything that you have done, would you want to get charged for it? Mm. What if God holds you accountable for every single thing you have done? Not forgiving you. I'm talking about you have to answer for everything you have done. How would that look? Mm. So I would say, forgive, let it go. Let God deal with it. In my case, let me give you an example. This case, this was killing me. Hmm. Literally killing me. And I had to let this thing go. And in letting it go, it brought me so much life. Amen. I'm wide awoke now versus who I was two years ago. God would do something with your hurt, with your brokenness. He the only one can fix it. We can try. I could have tried. My trying was to, to hurt him. It wouldn't have worked. God told me that day in the park, I can do this way better than you. What are you doing? Get out of my way. That's good. And I walked away. Look what God is doing now. Amen. So I urge you to let that thing go. No matter how deep, no matter how bad you think it is, it's all the same to him. Give it to him. Watch what he do with it. He'll open up your life. As long as you're holding on to that thing, He's going to stand there and watch you hold it. Hmm. Let it go. Give it to God. And watch some things change. That's good. Thank and I'd say if you're looking down here and you, uh, you, know, you, you, you see where I'm coming from because you've done some bad things to some people, um, you know, God cannot bless you until you let that go. If you owe somebody an apology, apologize. That's your part. The day in the park, I wanted him to say, I forgive you, but that wasn't my part. My part was simply to say, I'm sorry. So if you owe somebody that apology, go do it. Don't worry about if they're going to say something slick to you. Don't worry about what it might be or what it might, you owe them that. You need to say it because God wants to release you from that. And then don't hold yourself to, the, to a higher standard than what God has held you to. He said, as far as the east is from the west, so far are your sins removed from you. What would it look like if I was up here you know, holding my head low, ashamed still of the things I did, even though forgiveness has been given? God has a plan for all of us, and we can't walk into it if we're holding ourselves to a higher standard than he holds us to. Andrew and Jamil, I'm grateful for you guys sharing with us today. And uh, I see, I, you all may or may not be able to see, but I, I see the glistening in your eyes, mm -hmm. and I understand what it means for you to share as you've shared with us today. And uh, we're grateful for your life and your witness. Thank Please you. show your thanks to Andrew and Jamil. Thank you. Thank you guys.